If you have fear in your life, that's proof that you're not confident in him. If you're afraid of dying, you don't really trust him. This is where we're at right now. I know God's got some of you squirming because he's put his finger on these things. And you're almost convinced. And again, for 20 minutes in altar time, you won't be afraid of death. All right, I finally. Because God moves on you so much that it takes the emotions of it away. And then the next day you get up and that heaviness is there and that emotion is there. And the, you just want, somebody just died and you went to their funeral. And now you can't get it out of your head and, and, and you're stuck there. And God wants you to come to the veil and just say, God, I can't get rid of this death thing, this fear thing, this worry thing. you got to take it, God, because you're my light. You're my light. You're my salvation. You're my salvation. You're my salvation. Two plus two is four. I'm going back to the basics on that. So would you stand with me? We're not just, unfortunately for you, this isn't a sermon where you can say that was a nice point. Let's go on. What are you fearing right now? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid that you're going to lose your job? Are you afraid that people are going to finally figure out that you don't know what you're doing in something? Because all of us feel that way down deep inside. All of us at times wonder, you know, I, I think I love God, but I know that I have problems over here, and one of these days I'm probably going to be exposed to be the devil. But he's my salvation. He's my light. If I have a problem, I just need to keep opening that back door, let more of that light in. I just need to let more of that power into my life. I just need more of him. I don't need to become, I don't, I don't need to work at it out here. I need to work at it out back here because the more I work at it back here, the more it just floods out here. If I open this back door, light will come in and light will come right out. So I, I like for you to, to, to be very soul-searching at this point and just say, okay, God, lately you put your finger on things. That situation, my spouse, my work, my money, my health, whatever it is that, that's got you worried or afraid or angry, he's your light and your salvation. I want you to practice right now saying to God, God, I can't do anything about this, but I give it to you, and I, I'm open to whatever you give to me. I just stand here weak, but, Lord, I don't want to live this way anymore. I don't want to, I don't want to just be happy at altar time. Tomorrow, all day long, and if it doesn't, if I can't make it all day long, at least for a few hours, maybe by a couple of weeks of this, I can make it all day long without worrying at all, without fearing at all, without having any, any, any kind of being afraid in my life, any kind of anger in my life. I'm not saying you never get angry, but I'm just saying if there's some people who are driven by anger, everything they do is they're mad at the world or they're mad at their parents or they're mad at what life has done, they're mad at God, and it drives them. You don't believe that, just look at the demonstrations that are happening in our streets in America today. Anger. That's not us. Would you pray, God? We're not just playing. We're, we're appropriating this right now. Anger, frustration, doubt, and fear. We can't just say go away. We have to let them go every day. We have to refuse to let them set up strongholds in our lives. I pray right now that you would help people to recognize what you're doing in their life. I pray you would help them to put it all on the table again, all over again, God. I pray you would set them free from fear, set them free from worry, set them free from doubt, set them free from the things that, that, that the enemy would bind them with. You said you'd come to set at liberty those that are bound. I pray you would set at liberty everyone in this room. Set them at liberty from things they have not forgiven. Set them at liberty from things that have not been healed in their life. Set them at liberty 
from mindsets that they have used their entire life to protect themselves. Set them at liberty from morals and values of this world. Set them at liberty from mindsets that the world has put into them through what they've seen, what they've watched, what they've been told, what they've been taught by people who don't know you. Set us free, God. I pray you'd set us free and you'd begin to flow through our life and be, so we can say you are our light and our salvation. You are our light and our salvation. Hallelujah. 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 Would you just let them love you for a minute? Thank you for your love, God. It's not about us trying harder. It's about us letting go. It's about us trusting you. It's about us letting you love us, God. It's about us letting your love come into our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. So, I, my, my recipe says to use two eggs and four cups of flour. I want to double my recipe. And so I do that, and I use one and a half eggs and, and eight cups of flour, and something's wrong. It's like, this is too dry. I, I need to go back. I did something wrong with my math. I need to go back and get my math right. Double one is, or double, what's one plus one? two and two plus two four that's easy stuff right but we don't do that in our spiritual life many times we get out there and we're not happy and we think it's because we're not smart or we need a new outfit or we need more chocolate he's my light and my salvation Let's go back to Psalms. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? If he's not your light and salvation, then you should be afraid. But if he is, you don't need to be afraid. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If I am sick, I, I don't have hope in healing. I have hope in a God who heals. That's big difference. Let's go on to verse 2, and I'll show you. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came on me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Now, that's a, that's a praise report. Anybody had any enemies stumble and fall? Yeah. Only three? Has anybody had any victories in your life? Has God healed anybody in this room? Has God given you any kind of... That, that should be in your prayer times. Oh, God, I remember when this very thing came up before, and I was all afraid, and then I finally got... Two plus two, right? I, I finally went back and remembered, you're my salvation. I finally put it in your hand, and lo and behold, it all worked out. And guess what? We're right back to the same thing, and I'm doing the same thing again. Uh, so I need to go back and do the same thing I did to get out of that problem and go back to two plus two is four. You are my salvation. You are my strength. Why am I afraid? Who am, if I'm afraid, it, then it means that he's not my light and my salvation. I can, I can back up. Four equals two plus two, right? You can go backwards in math like that, right? So if I'm afraid, he is not my salvation. If I'm afraid, he is not the strength of my life. If he's the strength of my life, I am not afraid. That's the, that's the formula. Verse 3 says, though an host should encamp against me. Now, what I'm showing you is scripture is very deep. Most of you know this very well. It's alive. It'll speak to whatever circumstance you're in. Whatever place you're at in your growth, it'll speak to that. Though a host should encamp against me. Let me put this in everyday terms. Though I have a terminal illness. Though I have a physical ailment that does not go away. Though I have a boss who will not quit, though I have a, a financial situation that does not seem to get better, though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though I, I am still poor, I prayed for years not to be poor, but I'm still poor, my heart 
wants to fear, but because he is my salvation, because he is my light, my, I shall teach my heart not to fear. He is my light. He is my salvation. And I can pray, and I believe in the power of prayer. Don't get me wrong. I've been preaching that for years. I'm not changing that. I believe we can pray, and God can give us jobs. I believe we can pray, and God can heal situations. I believe we can pray, and God will t- take physical things in our body and make them right. I believe that. But what if it hasn't happened? Though hosts should encamp against me, that does not say God is not real. And that does not say prayer does not work. Even if it doesn't change, my heart shall not fear. And the war shall rise against me. I have prayed, God, don't let that sickness come back. And it comes back. Now, Some of you may be saying, how can you say this? How can you say in one, the prayer works and God heals in one, on the one hand? On the other hand, you say, well, if he doesn't heal. Well, because I, I go back to the word of God. And I see times when God healed and I see times when God didn't heal. I see Jesus healing everyone's diseases in one scenario. Then he goes to his hometown and he can't heal anybody. And maybe that was because they had problems with it. But we're reading in between the lines to think that he healed absolutely everybody who ever had any kind of sickness that was around him. He only raised three people from the dead in his ministry. Don't you suppose he was around far more than three people who died in three years? So I have to quit hoping in healing. I have to quit hoping in God raised the dead I have to quit hoping in prayers being like abracadabra get a new job that's not my foundation that's not my source of joy my joy is not that I have a magic wand that I can wave over my problems in life my my salvation my joy is in that it doesn't matter if God lets my prayers change things or not change things I still have this shelter I still have this strong tower I still have this salvation I still have a God who loves me My body can literally die, and he'll be loving me all the way. He'll love me on my deathbed. That's the hope of a Christian. But but somehow we play these mind games. We all know we're going to die, but we all believe prayer is going to keep every sickness away. Go figure. How are you going to die? God protects me, right? I've had him protect me. My wife and I were driving to uh, Hartford. Was it Hartford? We were going to go do the uh, dedication, and a car came over in my lane. Uh, it was just right there. I, I didn't even know that I was responding, and I yanked the wheel over. But it's, we, you know, we were going 60 miles an hour, and God protected me. I, I don't know how we didn't get hit. God does that. But I know of people who died in car accidents. So you can't make this doctrine that God always saves us from car accidents. So you can't be safe. You can't find your salvation in God will never let me die in a car accident. You can only find your salvation in my life is his and when it's time to go, he'll let me go. And when it's not time to go, he'll keep me from going. In him I have salvation. In him I have hope. In him I have joy. So the enemy can nag me. I can be driving down the road and he can say, you're going to die today. And I'll say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. He is the strength of my life. And though a host should encamp against me, and even if I do die today, so what, I'll be in heaven worshiping God. It'll be a great, a grand finale. Why don't you turn it around and look at the devil and say, well, you're going to send me home? You're going to send me to the streets of gold? You're going to give me a pass out of this place, devil? You're going to help me go where angels worship God and where people never die? And you'll find out he's bluffing you. I will be confident, the scripture says. I'm not confident because I'm Mr. Holy. I'm not confident because I have a license in my pocket that says I'm a minister. I'm not confident because I've been in this church for 20 years. I'm not confident because my family is Christian. I'm not confident because I've done everything right, so God's given me a good job and a good home and a good family. Because it can be like Job. God will let all of that go away to see if I trust him. Verse 4 says, 
One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to acquire of his temple. One thing we have that the psalmist didn't have, the psalmist had to go to a physical building to get into the Holy of Holies. But we, because of Jesus' death, can enter into the Holy of Holies right now. You are the temple of God. The, the power of God is within you. But you have to let it flow out. Again, that's why this model is here. In your spirit, God wants to erupt as a, as a river out of your belly, but your brain and your heart stand as blockers. If you'll just desire that one thing, if I'm afraid, what's the solution? Dwell in the presence of God. Seek the Almighty. If I lose, lose my job, how do I comfort myself? I dwell in the house of the Lord. I inquire of him in my holy place, in that, in that prayer room. Verse, f- verse 5, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in the secret, in his secret pavilion. Excuse me, in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on, on a rock. You need to understand this. The world thinks that we are burying our head in the sand. But we're not. We're burying our soul in Him. We're in Christ. When, when someone's on our deathbed and we, we have peace about it, we are not pretending that person is not sick. We are so confident in our God that we know whatever God does is right, and whatever he chooses. And we're going to pray because sometimes he wants us to pray. We're going to tell him what our will is in the situation. But ultimately, if he says no, he, hey, uh, he, he's going he's gonna to take care of things. Are you understanding this inside out thing? Verse 6, And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies. Who are my enemies? Out here, your enemies are the world system. All the junk that's happening around you. All, all the morals and values that be thrown at you. And, and more and more, they're going to be attacking good people. And the church will one day, probably, uh, well, someone just mentioned last week, uh, someone put an article in the, one of the newspapers out in California that Brother Haney was preaching hate speech because of something he said in his sermon. They're coming after the churches. So, yes, that's our enemies. But those enemies that we focused on for so long are really not the most powerful enemies. Your most powerful enemies are right here. Your thinking and your feeling. Because if those enemies can influence your thinking and your feeling... They get you to make your choices. And it's all about your choices. It's all about your choices. I have to choose. Do I get angry? Or do I forgive? They say, get angry. He says, forgive. They say, tell them off. He says, love. Hmm, hmm. I tried being nice, and they just kept being mean. They did that to me too, Jesus says. My head's going to be up above my enemies around me. He's going to lift me up above my anger. He's going to lift me up above my fears. Because of his truths, two plus two is four. The enemy is trying to tell me two plus two is five. He's trying to tell me I'm going to die. He's trying to tell me I'm going to lose my job. He's trying to tell me I'm a nobody. That's all bad math. I go to God and find out the good math. And he takes me up above all of that. And I could still choose to believe I'm bad, but he told me I was good. So the more I choose his opinion and his truth, the more it changes the way I think about myself. And and I, I totally interact with the world differently. I will sing. I will sing praises to the Lord. So here's a guy whose enemies are encamped around him, who might have a war coming against him, and he's singing and having joy. And the world looks at that and says, there 
is a psycho. Those preachers get up there, spit and sputter, and everybody raises their hands, and they'll make fun of us. But Scripture tells us they won't understand us. If they don't have the power of God in them, if they've never felt the power of love, if they've never been overwhelmed by the Spirit of God, they can't even begin to understand the joy that you can have bubbling up inside of you because they don't have it. They've never experienced it. That's why instead of being angry at them, instead of being defensive toward them, we need to have so much confidence that we can actually love them. We can actually say, "Uh, uh, you know what? I know you don't understand, but let's talk. Let's go to lunch. I will sing. So let's try that again. Would you stand? We're going to sing. And here's, here's the test. I know I'm, I may be having you overanalyze right now, but we're, we're trying to decide the difference in the soul and the spirit, remember? When we sing, if you've had a bad day and your heart is saying, well, I can't sing like everybody else because uh, <clears throat> my asthma acted up. I can't sing like everybody else because I've been sick all week. I can't have joy because my best friend died. But that's just not true. Because he's the source of your joy. You just have to choose what's defining your life right now. What's making you think the way you're thinking and feel the way you think. The things that are coming from outside or the things that come from inside. So as you sing... You're not pretending to have joy. It's not like, okay, it's time to sing, and everybody thinks I ought to be happy, so I'm going to put a smile on, and I'm going to clap. That's hypocrisy. I am going to focus on truth instead of the lies that the enemy tells, or instead of the fears and the things that God is setting me free from, and I'm going to focus on love, joy, peace, who he is, authority, lifting me up above my enemies. He doesn't kill my enemies. He lifts me up above my enemies. My joy is in that he is my strength. I'm submitted to him, and he protects me because I'm submitted to him. And so I can have joy even though my my leg still hurts, even though my job situation hasn't changed. So see, just see if you can sing this song with joy. If you can't, God is helping you to see you're still believing some things that I didn't tell you. Would you sing? See if you can let joy out. Just stay where you're at. Let me make a distinction here. You've been doing this for years. What you just did, these praise breakthroughs that we have, when you get to praising God, when you truly praise Him, you're speaking truth. And the truth is taking you up above all the junk in your life that you've been believing, all the lies that have been dominating your thinking. And, and so that's why we love to come to church. Most people who are here love to come to church. Uh, those that never tap into this they come to church and then they leave because they don't it doesn't do anything for them but but if they'll let it take them higher that praise actually does it it cleans the brain and it cleans the heart it washes us so we can be more pure and we can let God flow through us so, and we leave saying positive things now the distinction I want to make is this we clap our hands a lot as people but a lot of times we're clapping our hands to say, I agree with you, right? Like if the president's giving his speech, his State of the Union speech, uh, usually whatever party he's in, they're really clapping a lot and the other party's not, right? And if there's a standing ovation, it's the half that's on his party that, you know, because they're really saying, we're with you. Happens sometimes when people preach too. But better... Better is when we clap our hands, not for what we understand about him, and not for what he's done, but just for who he is. I'm clapping my hands knowing that he might come to me like he did last weekend and speak to some things that I don't really want to hear about. I'm not clapping my hands because I like what he's saying or because that you're the God I wanted you to be. You came through, Jesus. You healed my body, so now I'm going to clap my hands. I'm clapping my hands because if he kills me, if he lets him chop my head off, if he lets him boil me in oil, 
If they hang me upside down on a cross, he's God. He knows what he's doing. I've given my life to him. He can do whatever he wants with me. I clap to him. I'm going to throw my crown at his feet because I'm not, I'm not in heaven for me. I'm in heaven for him. Whoa. Is, that, is, heaven, is heaven for us or for him? I, I just hit on a math issue there, didn't I? We usually think of heaven as our reward. But that's where finally every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. <laughs> Heaven's for him. And, and it, 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 we, we will be blessed by being there. It's like, why are you getting married? My wife and I are reading a book that uh, Patty loaned to us, uh, Good or God. And we're at a certain point where he uses his illustration about gold diggers. He says, when you see a 75-year-old man with a 40-year-old woman, they might be in love. But if he's wealthy, she's probably making him look good, and he's got deep pockets, and they both are willing to make that arrangement to get what they want out of the relationship. So why are you in a relationship with your God? Are you engaged to him because of heaven? Or do you love him? He hasn't answered a prayer lately and you're a little miffed at him? I know you have the money in the bank, but you won't buy that for me. Well, honey, do you love me? Why do you clap? All right. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really clap and jump because last week you gave me a raise, and I want three more raises. So notice this, God. I'm going to really do a dance. Do it again, and I'll jump twice as high. God's saying, you want my money? Would you clap for me if you lost your job? See the difference? Now with no music, let's just clap and shout to the Lord because of who he is. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may go back to your seat. Do you see how, how different that is from being in an exciting service and running the aisles because three other people ran the aisles? That, that can have its place, and sometimes praise is contagious. But when it's a genuine praise, it's based on true confidence, then it, it, there's something that flows. There's something pure about it. There's something that it does something to you, but it's, it's really for him, and the byproduct is what happens to you. So I'd like for you now to just sit and let him respond. I've asked my wife to sing a song she wrote about God's love. And I'd like for you now... To not, not praise and just let it come back to you. Because God doesn't owe you anything, but he wants, he wants to love you. So just close your eyes and let God minister to you as she says. Sometimes your devotional prayer time will be just overcoming those things in your mind and your heart. It will sound like this. I feel so bad, but I trust you, God. I'm so afraid, but I, I choose not to be afraid because... I can trust in you, Jesus. And it'll be you acknowledging that you're trying to live from the inside out, but without his help, you can't do it. If we go back to the psalm. <clears throat> Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and have mercy also upon me and answer me. And I'm not going to pick some of these apart because we don't have time. Verse 8. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. We've just done that. What you just broke through this morning, you can do tomorrow at home. Seek his face. Verse 9, hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. Verse 10, when my father and my mother forsake me. I want to spend just a minute on this. 
There's nothing more painful in life than family abandonments. You've been through a divorce, it's probably the worst, one of the worst things you'll go through. If you've ever lost a loved one, if your children have ever gotten mad and left home, if you've ever, uh, if you've ever had a father tell you he didn't love you, if you've ever had someone abandon you, there's nothing. He's striking at the deepest, deepest, deepest part of your soul. When you have been abandoned, that abandonment cries out, you're no good. You probably weren't smart enough. You, you said this. Your, your heart and your mind, the enemy can come through that hole. That's a stronghold. When you've been abandoned, that becomes a stronghold that if you don't make your peace with that and you don't give it over to God somehow, the enemy will always be able to come through that. It's like a, it's like a hole in the side of your house that the cold wind will just rush through there. You can have 99% of your house closed in and only have a one square foot hole somewhere in your house that's not closed in and your whole house will be freezing. You could turn the heater up and you'll have to burn gallons and gallons of oil just to keep up with that one little hole. So if you've been abandoned, the enemy comes in, and he's, he's accusing you to your mind and to your heart, and God's back here saying, I'd like to say something to that. And you have to decide to let God close that hole up. You have to decide it doesn't matter what my sinful mother or father did. That's what sin does. What he thinks matters more than what she thinks. I have to die to the opinions of my mom and my dad and my sisters and my brothers. Jesus said, you have to be so in love with me, it's almost like you hate everybody else in comparison. We don't have time to go through all of that, but God may be trying to help some of you. He may be down to the bedrock in some of your lives where what you thought was healed, he's showing you still has a little bit more. He put, he put some plywood over it. But he'd like to take it off and really put insulation in there and put some sheetrock on there and then put the mud around those holes so there's not even a little bit of a breeze that comes through there. When your mother and your father forsake you, God will take you up. So I'd like you to practice this. Would you say out loud, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me more than my family. Jesus loves me even if my family doesn't. My family hurt me, but Jesus didn't. That's the kind of thinking that we have to establish in our minds. That's what will set you free. That's truth. Believe it or not, when you say what you've said for hundreds of times, my mother rejected me. That means I'm bad. Two plus two is five. That's wrong. That's bad math. Your mother just did, she, she was just overwhelmed. In fact, when you forgive her, you might find out one of these days that she was just overwhelmed. She didn't know how to love. But you give that to God. My mother didn't love me, but Jesus does, so I'm loved. That two plus two is four. That's the truth. That's where you need to live. You need to live in that realm. When your mother and your father forsake you, the Lord will take me up. The Lord will take me up. He is my light and my salvation. He is the strength of my life. He, and and if, I, if my mind keeps going to other things, I'm dumb, I'm bad, I'm ugly, I'm weird, I'm fat, I'm stupid, that's all bad math. You're an eternal being. The world puts far too much importance on how fat or skinny we are. Tall or short, color of our skin, color of our hair, if we have hair or not, that's all a bunch of junk.
If you've been forsaken, let's just pray for one another. Reach over and pray for someone. God, help them to think straight about themselves. Would you pray for somebody right now? God, help them to think straight about themselves. I Pray against doubt. Pray against lies. Pray against the things that have gotten into our lives through abandonment, sin. In Jesus' name, set them at liberty from thinking about themselves like the enemy wants them to think. God, help them to think about themselves as you have defined them. Help them to think of themselves as children of the King. Help them to think of themselves as priests and kings. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Verse 11, teach me thy way, O Lord. And lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. You know what we're saying? We're saying, God, teach me how to think now. I've been thinking for years that I'm bad. You say I'm good. Teach me how to think that I'm good. I've been thinking for years that I'm unlovable because somebody had trouble loving me. But you haven't had trouble loving me, so I need to think that that was their problem, not your problem. You love me. Teach me your ways, oh God. Show me your past. These things that I have... I have these grooves in my mind. I have convinced myself they're true, and they're not. Help me to let go of the things that are not true and hold on to the things that are true. Now, you don't let go of everything to the devil. You let go of them to God. You go into the inner chamber, and you say, God, I believe you're one. If you're not one, let me know. I'll let go of that if it's not true, and God will reassure that to you. His word's very plain on that. If you have any doubts, go to God. Don't go to your neighbor and don't go to the devil. Go to God. Teach me thy ways, O Lord. Would you say that out loud? Teach me thy ways, O Lord. Say it again. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Lead me in a plain path because if I think right, I can go right over my enemies. Verse 12. Deliver me not over to the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, such as breathe out cruelty. God... Deliver me from all these thoughts that come through my mind and through the strongholds that are in my life. They're, they're coming after me. They're telling me every day I'm a loser. They're telling every day that I'm, I'm going to die. They're telling me every day I probably don't have the doctrine right. They're telling me every day I'm probably not saved. God, those are my enemies. They keep coming up against me. Deliver me not over to my enemies, God. Help me to think your ways, Lord. Let your will and your ways just drive my enemies away. Verse 13. I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Would you stand? That was a dozen sermons. Now, let's just talk to God. And God may be doing something completely different on the front row right than he is the back row left. But I'd like for you just to give him one more little period of time. We're going to be out here early so you don't, don't have a lot of snow to worry about. Just wait on the Lord. So if you want to be noisy, that's fine. But you don't have to be noisy right now. It's not a praise time. It's a waiting on the Lord. I'd just like you to talk to him about whatever's on your mind right now. And try to help him teach his ways. Talk to him about how to think about things. If, if just a few minutes ago when I talked about abandonment, that came up, we'll talk to him about that. Whatever it is on your heart right now. You can bow your knee if you want. You can come to the front if you want. You can stay where you're at. It doesn't matter. Let's just all wait on the Lord for a few minutes as my wife plays. God, we come to you. Wait on you. We wait on you. We wait on you. Our desire is to know you. And if we can't talk with you, we want to move everything out of our way. But if we're having trouble, we will not believe the lies of the enemy that you don't love us. We will not believe the lies of the enemy. Just because our prayer time has been dry lately, that does not mean you don't love us. It does not mean you have abandoned us. It just means it's been a dry time. But I pray, God, that you would reign on our hearts. I pray that you would 
Shower us with your love. I pray that you would minister here in these last few minutes to needs that I haven't even addressed. I pray you talk to people about things that I haven't even talked about here today, God. You would set them free from things that are in their mind or in their heart. You would lift them up above their enemies, God. You would help them to think straight and to forever conquer those naggings, those thoughts of shame. You may have healed them of shame, but they're still thinking shameful thoughts. They still think badly of themselves, even though they've been healed of the wounds, even though they've forgiven. They're still thinking the way that they've always thought. I pray you'd set us free from those mindsets, from those grooves that are in our mind, God. We wait on you right now. I believe in you to miraculously heal. I believe in you, Lord, to to let your blood flow here right now, God. I believe you to forgive sins right now. I believe in you to fill with your spirit if someone needs a refreshing or needs to be filled with your spirit for the first time. You're able to do that with no one laying hands on them. If they just open their heart up to you right now, God, you're able to fill them with your spirit. Let your spirit flow here right now, God. Let your love flow right here today. When everyone leaves here, let them feel a love that's so solid that they can be confident in spite of the, of the bad leg or in spite of the bad job or in spite of the low finances or in spite of life not really being everything they meant wanted it to be. You are taking care of them. They can trust in you, leaning not to their own understanding in all their ways acknowledging you, God. As we wait on you, I pray, Lord, that you would fill us. I pray, God, that your strength would come into us. Not that we psych ourselves out, Lord, but that we open our minds and our hearts to you. We we give place to you in Jesus' name. I was watching one of the political demonstrations on a clip the other day, and there was one of the newly elected cabinet members walking by, and someone who didn't agree with her was standing there saying, Shame, 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 shame. And whatever you think about them or whatever was happening, that, that was just a picture of what the enemy does. It goes back to choices. Only you control what you're going to think about yourself. And the enemy is nonstop. He's hollering at you all the time. He'll wear you down and wear you down. Wear you you, you got to get a thick skin. And that thick skin, the world is telling you, you are being anti-intellectual. What they're saying is you won't think the way we want you to think. You're being hateful. What they're saying is you won't have the opinion we're having and anybody who doesn't think the way we're thinking is hateful. You have to go back and say, what do you think? And then know they hated him, they'll hate you. But you're not even playing the game. You just kind of know, you just kind of smile. There's a lady that was on a plane the other day and there was a guy that was going to the Right to Life March and she just went off on him. They took her off the plane because she just started tearing into him just because he was going to Washington. To, and and he, he was being interviewed on the news, and he just said, well, I, I didn't want to hurt her. I, I, you know, maybe she was just having a bad day. I just want her to have the love of Jesus. I thought that was a very good way to... That's, that's who we are. They love those that hate you. Pray for those that spitefully use you. Why? Because we're living from the inside out. And they really don't have a clue. Don't, don't be condescending like, you dummy, you don't have a clue. It's more like, oh, I wish you could know the one that I know. I wish you could feel what I feel. I wish you could have your sins washed away so you weren't so angry. I wish you could forgive people so you didn't have such bitterness inside of you. And if I get half a chance, I'll try to lead you to that relationship. That way, we're not, some Christians live right here, and they're always defensive, and that's why they're so ugly with the world. They have to be defensive, and they have to argue with everybody. They're right, and, you know, they think that they're fighting for Jesus when they're just interfacing with the world. They're not letting God come through them. It's their brain against the enemy's brain. It's their heart against the enemy, and it'll wear them out. 
They, they almost have to get ugly and bitter. So you got Christians just as ugly looking as other people who are demonstrating. When it should be like Jesus, who sometimes opened not his mouth and as a ship before the shears was dumb. How could Jesus just, how could he just hang on the cross and not say anything? He was so confident. So confident. He didn't have to defend himself. If, if King David wrote that psalm, the Lord's my light, my salvation. And he got to that point that said, when my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord will lift me up. I don't know. We don't know historically what happened there. But I, I, the thought came to me, when Saul was chasing David, where were his big brothers? You never see his family coming to his defense. But God took care of David. And God made David more famous than Saul. And God chose the family of David to bring the Savior through. So don't you worry about, even if your family forsakes you. If everybody in your family thinks you're the wacko in the family, you talk in tongues. It's all right. They're not going to be in heaven with the book. They're not going to snatch you out of this world. When you die, you're not going to stand before them. You can be confident because you have a relationship with an almighty God. Would you give him one more hand, praise? <laughs> Hallelujah.